молитвами святой, хоть и отца нашей, Господи Иисусе Христе, Боже наш, помилуй нас сами. Благослови, душе моя, Господа, благословен Иси, Господи. Благослови, душе моя, Господа. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Heavenly King, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things. Treasure of blessings, bestower of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all that defiles us, and O good one, save our souls. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Welcome, everyone. This is the Orthodox Show. My name is the Badger Dad, and I'm joined today by a very um, esteemed brother in Christ, um, Vitali. He goes by the Russian Catholic on YouTube and has been blogging and doing videos for some time now. Uh, he's also a covert uh, Vatican spy in uh, the Russian lands, and he's going to win um, Muscovy back from from the schismatics and bring about uh, a new Catholic Republic there. So welcome, Vitaly. Yes, all of that, God willing. <laughs> Hello. So... Um, uh, again, I'm very thankful to have you in, uh, zooming in all the way from the, I, I don't know, would you call St. Uh, Petersburg the, the Catholic motherland of, of Russia? or? I think it's just generally motherland of Russia, <laughs> since I don't accept Moscow. So, you know, I have to say that St. Petersburg is the real uh, center of Holy Rus. Absolutely. Well, second, second only to Kiev. Uh, of course, sure. Ke- 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 but hey, hey, we're not we're not going to we're we're coming together as as the Kievan Christian yes. brothers today. Not going to debate about yes. old territorial disputes. Um, sure. So today, our our topic is going to be um, about about unionism and and some some of the questions that have come up today. Specifically, I think. You know what is our stance on um, Orthodox in communion with Rome? What are the problematic elements of that? And I know you've talked about this before on your channel, um, but specifically this this sort of the Zogby initiative, the Zogbyites, who mm-hmm. kind of wish to hold a dual communion between um, and some some Orthodox jurisdiction and 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 Rome. So mm-hmm. maybe, maybe Vitaly, uh, again, because again, this is very much a part of your own personal journey of faith. What, yeah. How would you kind of define um, uniatism in, in terms of like maybe a bit about church history, but also like what does it mean to be a uniat? Right. So it's a kind of a disputed term. I'm not really, uh, I mean, I use it myself and I like it very much, uh, especially because it was a uh, you know, a, a negative uh, term. Uh, and in church history, whenever Christians were called something negative, they would wear it as a badge of honor, as many other persecuted groups, I guess, but um, uh, Christians specifically. So um, Russian church, for example, Russian Catholic church, rather, uh, generally, for example, is not uh, defined as a union church, uh, because one of the, I think, uh, main um, main um, kind of qualities of unionism is a corporate union that involves uh, established hierarchy that has an eparchy or arch eparchy or, you know, a patriarchate uh, in very limited cases, uh, which enters into corporate communion with, um, with the Catholic church, with, uh, with the, with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, hence why I don't really understand uh, certain criticism of unionism, like we should abandon unionism, and then basically what they're describing is unionism. Uh, in some cases, in some cases they're they're not describing unionism, but in a lot of cases they will describe basically unionism. So I guess what they're trying to do is avoid the negative connotation of the word uh, that supposedly was like a forced uh, union. Uh, and I mean there are some reasons uh, uh, one can say that, but it's a very like a limited a way of looking at it. And anyway, so yeah, to me, it's a corporate union uh, with uh, the Bishop of Rome, which involves not only a simple kind of political union, but also 
um, <clears throat> faith, like so the union, it's, it's more to me a union of faith than union of anything else, uh, right? Um, so in that sense, union of faith, I can call Russian Catholics also unions because it's Russians and Orthodox entering into union, hence the unions, right? But technically, because it involves the corporate unity, the hierarchical unity, Russians are generally not considered unions because we never signed any uh, union. Right. So which is the term, usually it's a Polish-Lithuanian term, um, which uh, it not only applies to church uh, unions. So there is like political unions, they're all called unia, right? So yeah. um, basically we've never signed any type of union uh, thing. So our priests were, a lot of them were actually consecrated Catholics already. Uh, so they entered into communion as, um, as not, uh, as lay people, aside from a uh, few exceptions, mm -hmm. but a lot of them would enter as lay people. And then they were already made priests and bishops and all that within uh, Catholic church. So that's why Russians don't generally use that term. It's viewed as something for the Union of Ushgorod, the Union of Brest, uh, other unions, right? But um, but again, it's only a term. I like that term because the word unity is in it, right? So to me, there is no problem there. But yeah, that's how I would define uh, unionism. Right, and I, I think I think you you really hit the nail on the head there, uh, Vitali, because the the alternatives that have been suggested. I mean, I think I don't know if there's more we could say about unionism in general before getting into the the controversy with this uh archbishop zogby but mm -hmm. um there there doesn't seem to be a clearly thought out alternative that isn't just either lost in this kind of ecumenical um mist or right. is is just sort of like well we're we we are going to uh there's there's a future goal of some sort of of corporate unity uh sacramental unity but for right now we're just going to we're just going to say we're friends and that's that's yeah. that's the unity that we're going for so mm -hmm. i and i told i totally agree yeah i think it's i think especially our our two uh churches sui Iuris, have such a such a close connection um you know um the venerable Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky was mm -hmm. um, influential. Uh, I mean, he was the the major influence that that uh, consecrated and and uh, initiated this the movement uh, for the current the current Russian yeah. Greek Catholic uh, jurisdiction to come into being. Um, and his mm -hmm. brother, Blessed um, uh, Clementi, um, yeah. was was the exarch for a number of years as well. But you know, obviously, the the main uh, progenitor is being Blessed. Um, um, Leonid Fyodorov. Um, do you want, why don't we talk a little bit, do you, I'm sure you've got a lot more um, knowledge about his, his history. Um, was he, um, I th was he, he was a Russian, a Russian Orthodox priest before, uh, before his, his um, conversion? Actually, no, actually, no, he was not a uh, priest. He was a lay person okay. who uh, considered Catholicism um, but uh, didn't kind of like uh, had a, an intuitive understanding what he wanted, which is he wanted to stay Eastern, which goes back to uh, the Russian philosopher Solovyov, who influenced yes. a lot of uh, young people. Um, I wouldn't call Solovyov very uh, like orthodox in a regular sense, uh, okay. meaning like uh, he had strange ideas, but among other things, he had very sober ideas and it influenced a lot of people. Um, and I would also say that, uh, like a quick remark that, um, the earliest, I, I would even call not Fyodorov, Fyodorov obviously is the central figure, but, um, uh, Zerchininov, uh, who is the, you could say first priest who entered into communion with Rome, uh, for which he was uh, sent to, uh, prison for a number of years. And then through, uh, kind of, um, there was a, a aristocratic, uh, lady, uh, but, uh, I forget her last name. I'm very bad at last names. By the way, uh, I'll do a separate kind of, I'll do a series on uh, Catholic history in Russia, obviously. So for now, you know, forgive my, uh, I, I'm bad at dates, bad at names. Oh. Anyway, she was an aristocratic lady who converted to Catholicism. Um, but uh, at that time, um, kind of, they, they already kind of looked uh, okay at uh, Latin Catholics. 
uh, meaning Russians who would convert to Latin Catholicism. Right. Um, so she was able to kind of get him out of prison, um, although he was put still on, he was very like limited to where he could go. Uh, but anyway, he was an Orthodox priest who became um, Catholic and kind of that's, he got into trouble. But Fyodorov was a lay person who um, went basically to Metropolitan Sheptysky and he was very like um, struck with, with him, like how, how amazing, how awesome he was, uh, that he saw like a real image of what church unity is. Because he saw a very, you know, despite the fact that, uh, as we all know, uh, Metropolitan uh, comes from a Polonized um, Ruthenian uh, roots or Ukrainian, if you want to uh, call it that, right? Um, same, same, same with me. It's, it's, it's almost yeah. exact the same. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, um, but he like literally saw a person who loved Eastern tradition, who was uh, willing to kind of fight for it, defend it, but at the same time was very much uh, Catholic. And um, even, even to some extent, a little bit uh, more uh, in theology, at least a, a little bit more uh, Latinized, as uh, some people point out, like um, I think Deacon Daniel uh, Galadja had, uh, had a study on, uh, citations by Sheptysky, and it was a lot of Thomas Aquinas and uh, those guys, right? Um, that, that but anyway, was his father. I'm oh, sorry, I'm so sorry yeah. to tell you. That was yeah, his well, father, uh, um, Father Peter, Father Peter Galazzo. That's uh, his, Peter, his, Peter. Yeah, his, right, right, his right. seminal work, uh, The Liturgy and Theology of Andrei Sheptysky. Right, right. He quotes uh, in his pastoral letters, Sheptysky quotes verbatim from the fathers through Thomas Aquinas. Right, like, like right. memorized the memorized the Summa to such an extent that he's he's quoting the fathers from 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 Thomas Aquinas. I'm so sorry, but yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. And actually, it has a like a tra uh, earlier tradition in uh, the so-called Byzantine Thomas um, during the Palamite controversy. There was a lot of people who uh, Thomas Aquinas right before Palamas uh, just kind of boomed in uh, the Greek world uh, through the translation that was made, and so a lot of them were influenced even. Uh, as you know, Mark of Ephesus quotes uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. So, but anyway, so Fyodorov was really struck by him, and um, he kind of told him about what he wanted to do. But unlike with Zerchininov and other cases where they would make them priests very fast, uh, Fyodorov actually went through the whole training uh, in Italy. So he went there, and he was kind of he confirmed for himself that he wanted to a Byzantine rite, and um, his thoughts were like in his memoirs. He says that he. Um, really felt the rejection for nationalist patriotism, but felt this overwhelming love uh, for Russian people, who, and he called them the R uh, Russian ascetical people, who he wanted to kind of give back to, you know, place where he came from. And so after seminary, um, he was made a priest, not by Sheptitsky, because they were afraid that he's going to, because Sheptitsky was an enemy of Russian state, uh, an official term. Mm -hmm. enemy of the state right uh he, he was considered an austrian spy so um they tried to avoid um kind of uh this um suspicion of fyodorov once he would come back to russia by sending him to bulgaria and, and actually a bulgarian unit uh bishop uh consecrated him but unfortunately when or fortunately or unfortunately for a christian i guess it's fortunate that uh, Fyodorov became a, a, a confessor right away because once he came back to Russia, they arrested him right away. And uh, he was freed uh, thanks to a very tragic event for Russia. But first it was um, the so-called law uh, of tolerance to other religions. Uh, so that kind of helped, but then Bolshevik revolution, uh, or rather first, the first revolution came, which freed him. Uh, and he was able to work for a few years before the Bolshevik Revolution came, which then, you know, was very anti-religious. So, uh, but yeah, he he was kind of you could say, almost trained Catholic already. So he was right. never kind of obviously he was raised in Russian culture, right? So he mm -hmm. had a you know deep understanding of what that is. But his training was a thorough Catholic training already, unlike with some other people like Zerchininov. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe some other figures so I won't mention for the time's sake, but again, I'll try to do a video uh, on the whole history. I'll try to go yeah. into all the pers personalities and stuff like that. That'd be, that would be so, that'd be such a blessing. Um, Vitaly, I think I apologize. I think I confused, um, blessed Fyodorov with, uh, uh, father Nikolai Tolstoy. 
I think he yeah, was right. he not he was ordained by uh, by the uh, Melkite. Yes, Peter. yes, yes. I, I, think I got so. those two stories confused, and and again, don't worry about the dates. That's this shows more about the ideas, the narr the meta narrative, the narrative, and specifically about getting this information to to our Byzantine Catholic brothers and sisters. So right, thank right. you so much. And I think that is like especially right the witness of our of our martyrs. I I I don't know. Maybe I'll share it at some at some point. I I know I've already shared it on my Twitter, but my my kind of version of the uh, Pravoslavi Ili Smert, which is, of course, I mean, I don't want to go into that organization and their um, their um, sort ideology. of almost ideology and almost terrorist kind of activities. But, uh, you know, just that, that, that I sort of that, it's almost like an icon of we are Orthodox or give us Orthodoxy or death. Yeah, and I kind of did a, did a version of that for, for Unia. It's Unia. <laughs> Unia yeah. or death. And, oh, that, but I, what I put up at the, at the top and again, my, my church Slavonic is, is so poor. I, I am, I assume I totally butchered the, the, um, translation, but I tried to put the crown of the martyrs at the top. And I thought mm -hmm. that that, for me, that just made so much sense because the history of almost every single union church and, and even right, not technically a union church, but the Russian Greek Catholic church, yeah. it's, we are, we are the churches of the martyrs, you know, in the mm -hmm. last to you know several hundred years you know and obviously right are we have roman catholic missionaries and and of course wars and other other martyrdoms but you know you can really see the influence that that people who who would die right obviously you know uh josephat josephat kuncevich is another great example right. that the uniates in particular as churches uh fought and died to be in in, in communion with rome and yeah, and, and I think people need to also understand, um, especially like I'm living it like that, like no one is obviously, well, for now, at least nobody's persecuting me, but I understand how difficult it is uh, to live when no one is backing you up. Because first unions, you have to realize uh, the political side was not uh, in their defense. Most simple people uh, were not in their defense. Actually, one of the authors of the Russian history of Catholic Church mentioned this this discrepancy between uh, Uniates uh, and the Russian Catholics in a technical sense, that uh, Uniates um, were kind of carried by bishops and priests who tried to convince their people to get on board. Um, and then they kind of suffered. Imagine like, you know, if you're a good priest, you go to a parish and the parish does not accept you. So some people will say like, well, brave people against those evil uh, political politicized uh, bishops. But I, I, as I view it and as I read through it, it's more like, you know, a faithful priest coming to the parish, you know, an Orthodox priest, let's say a small Orthodox. And then the, the parish is like very liberal and they say, well, we don't care about, you know, this whole, you know, uh, following the councils and all that. We'll just do what we like. Right. That, that's right. kind of like that. Right. Uh, rather than, and it's and and again, it's very difficult. And for lay people in, in Russian Catholic Church, when all the kind of beauty, all the churches, all the all of that stuff does not belong to you, you have to pray in a small apartment. Um, you know, uh, kind of just being okay with your faith and Christ. So being content with that, and being content with the fact that you have just entered into full communion with the body of Christ, rather than anything else. And it's, and uh, it's very, like, it's not that difficult for me, to be honest. Like, I'm glad for our small, like, uh, catacomb little uh, chapel. But for a lot of people, it's very difficult. And it's very hard to hold on to your Catholic faith when it's just so much easier to be Orthodox, right? Especially when you have to go through. So you have to understand, like, it's not just martyr, you know, like, my, one of my Canadian friends used to say, like, do these guys, like he would ask about old believers, do these guys have like venerables or holy hierarchs? Because anyone can have a martyr. Like you just, die. but you know, when he said like, it's very mind boggling. Like it's, I think it's the most difficult thing to die or to confess, right? Your faith Absolutely. rather than, you know, I mean, all of it is difficult, but I'm mm -hmm. saying one can't just say like, oh, you know, anyone can have martyrs. <laughs> Because not everyone can, not everyone can be a martyr, right? Absolutely. It's God's, uh, God's grace. When you were talking about the, you know, the, the parish rejecting the priest, that is literally, and I, and I, I should send you this book. It's, it's 
harder to get now because it has a very limited run. But mm -hmm. the history of the um, uh, Redemptorist congregation in Canada shows that exact same thing. So especially where I'm from, I know you you had spent some time in, in Eastern Canada, Vitaly, yeah. but I'm uh, being a Western Canadian myself, our Ukrainian Greek Catholic churches were built by Belgian mis Redemptorist missionaries who who can who change rights and, mm -hmm. and started to found missions and and you know because again right there was just no priests there were no priests right. for the what the time the Ruthenian Catholics as they were called and mm -hmm. the the founder the the pioneer of this movement was Father Akil Delaire mm -hmm. and and he 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 and you know but he did he had a love he had a love for the Ukrainian people because again he was his his mission. Um, as a Belgian was to was was for the French, right? The French Catholics, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, uh, Saint Boniface was the arch arch diocese of the area. It was a very very French Catholic um, missionary effort, and but he saw the need of of these uniates, these uniates in, in in on the Canadian soil, and he said, "There's no one to give them the sacraments. There's no one to right, and they're losing their faith. They're losing their faith." Um, there was some there was some Orthodox missionary work and other schismatic like heretical sects um mm -hmm. almost apostate sects working in that area but it was majority was was uh to protestantism because the protestants were they were reaching out to people who were going to school especially teachers mm -hmm. people to get the teaching certificates uh ukrainians and they were saying hey i'll ordain you a presbyterian minister and you can have you will will translate the Presbyterian liturgy into Ukrainian, and you can have a Ukrainian liturgy, R Russian liturgy for these people, right? And mm -hmm. so this, this was a, a big, a big almost conspiracy to to gain gain the populace of the of the units. And so his efforts were were a godsend. It is absolutely providence because we would have lost much more of our population of units in Western Canada, but because he was Belgian, the many of the people outright rejected him they mm -hmm. said he, you're not you're not ours you you are not a you are not a uniate or or, or ruthenian yeah. priest and there mm -hmm. was a story i forget where it was either on the border of manitoba and saskatchewan where he literally went to do his priestly ministry in in a local parish and the 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 road was they had a they had a barricade on the road he moved the barricade went went through he went up to the church the church was boarded he 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 took the boards off of the church so he could go serve a divine liturgy and inside were were the people they had boarded themselves up into the church um and as soon as he got through uh the people came up and and, and beat him up right mm -hmm. obviously and even under the old canon that would be a a mortal sin to attack mm -hmm. a to attack a cleric but they mm -hmm. they said you are not going to serve liturgy for us like literally mm -hmm. like and to the point of to the point of actually physically beating him so in in his in the book um um vichnaya pamia eternal memory um the 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 biographer of father akil says that he would often refer to to the ruthenians the galicians as they were also called as a very, a very pig-headed people <laughs> but he but obviously right. he gave his life to give them right. Christ in the sacraments and in the word. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that is, that's very much a part of the union experience. Yeah. Um, this, you know, reminds me of like a reverse version of, uh, I forget the name of the movie. It's based on HP uh, Lovecraft story. Uh, okay. And actually there is a Byzantine church in there. I forget what it's called. Uh, but basically the whole story is uh, people are going insane because they're reading some book uh and they actually going and i'm like what is this is this a ukrainian church because it looks like and i and then i figured i've been to that church it's a ukrainian catholic church in uh near toronto i forget the small town uh we went to a concert there and okay. what happens is the door is barricaded but they're trying to get inside but there it's like a reverse again because it's, it's not like parishioners but it's like this devilish kind of figure who lives in there and does not allow people to enter through the church and stuff. I don't know, probably Lovecraft because he was a godless uh, writer. He probably didn't have any anything like that. But in that movie, if you're very <laughs> religious uh, and you watch like these stupid movies, sometimes you read things into them and like, yeah, this is the, this is how it is. Sometimes you try to break into the church, but inside of the church, something is, you know, does not allow you to go in there and something unholy is happening. Yeah. You know, because 
I, I forget, um, I don't know the English translation, but the um, one of the uh, prophecies about the end times, how the, um, uh, I don't even know how to translate it into English, like defilement will sit in the, in the tabernacle, right? So we're in, in like the holy place, yeah, right? And it kind yeah. of reminds me, and I think a lot of Christian authors wrote about it, that it, it's happening now when stubborn people are doing that, this type of stuff, or sometimes when unfaithful priest is doing uh, other things that are not supposed to be done, this is the, the, the thing, right? So and yeah, to the, go through that, it's very, you know, hard. The, the English translation is abomination of desolation. Right. The abomination okay. of desolation sits sits in the holy places. Is, is the right. sounds sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> and speaking of abominations of desolations, let's move on to our second topic about um, the Archbishop Zogby. Uh, of, um, oh, uh, oh no! Did you I, call him abomination? You know, God rest his soul. Yes, obviously. I'm sorry. That was tongue in cheek. I, I apologize. I don't mean to offend anyone. Any Melkite listeners? Obviously, he he. He, there were some there were some holy intentions in his work um but right. but obviously there's there's also some problems um mm -hmm. so yes uh, um archbishop elias zogby um yeah. uh again the dates i i could bring it up in front of me but um he was a one of the eastern prelates um at the second vatican council who brought up uh in his um in his um intervention uh a fame quite a famous intervention about what what unity with the with the orthodox should look like and he kind of developed developed it later um into what he called the zogby and what was called the zogby initiative where he he started a, a series of dialogues meetings with the um antiochian orthodox counterparts of, of his jurisdiction in order to see what what would we what would we have to do for this Melkite arch eparchy to be in communion with Rome, but also share communion with this eparchy uh, archdiocese of the Antiochian Orthodox Church. And it was ultimately rejected by the Holy Synod of the Melkite Patriarchate, but it's it's got lasting implications. And in fact, you know, I think that that's something we I've talked about before in podcasts and stuff. That there are there are those there are those Uniates who just really really like. Uh, Byzantine liturgy, and they they almost prefer it if they were Orthodox, but they've they've got some connection to Catholicism that they don't quite want right. to go and become mm -hmm. Orthodox. So mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe Vitaly, you can enlighten us more about Zogby, Zogby and the and Zogbyites. Yeah, I mean, I won't touch on the history because again, anyone can read it. And actually, I tried to read up uh, more about it, but in terms of like what is available for free. Uh, not that much, but I mean, all the other facts are pretty, you know, well known. So, uh, but yeah, there were just, uh, there was a synod in 74. They talked with, uh, with, um, with the Orthodox, right? With the Antiochian Orthodox. Um, and then in 75, there was a declaration. And then in 1995, there was, uh, in 1995, there was uh, another meeting, which in that last meeting, that's where the, where the name Zogby Initiative comes from. Okay. Right, um, where there were a lot of like uh, smart people that try to bring about, um, you know, the uh, the union. Um, yeah, and then in '96 he published a book, which was very controversial. Even the name, they he tried to stir up some controversy so that people start discussing it. Um, but uh, yeah, thankfully, and I'll say this uh, later why thankfully never nothing came came of it. But first, you know, I'd like to, because, yeah, you talked about good intentions. And, uh, I mean, probably I'll make a comparison that might offend people. But uh, if you're a faithful Catholic uh, or a kind person, I don't think it'll, it'll be offensive. It's kind of like with certain Catholics or Christians in general who want to kind of um, be welcoming to uh, people with same-sex attraction. And... From time to time, and I know this from uh, living in Russia where there was a lot of racism and nationalism, how sometimes um, above others you feel when you're not nationalist and racist. When you're speaking with a non-Russian person and you're kind of like, well, I'm just such a great guy. You know, no one will speak to her or to him, but I'm just such a great non-racist person. And I think 
uh, a lot of people don't have this consciously, but they have kind of a warm feeling um, about themselves. And also they feel that they're doing something correct because it's related to kindness, to loving a person, which are all very good, right? So in a lot of cases, people who find, uh, feel compassion towards LGBT uh, or same-sex attraction, I don't like to use uh, the, the official terms for that, uh, but yeah, same-sex attraction, they go over the top because they are guided more by this feeling of compassion, the desire to um, show that they're good people and they want them to feel welcomed. They kind of override other things of a higher uh, kind of um, from a higher plane, which is, you know, truth, goodness, even aesthetical, you know, um, you should never do that because uh, especially for Byzantine Catholics, the vision of the world is very hierarchical. You know, if you read St. Dionysius, the Arapagite, or Pseudo Dionysius, if you want, uh, you get this cosmic kind of view of the world, which is very hierarchical. You can call it Platonism, whatever, but I think it's just uh, a way to look at things. And um, anyway, and so I think with the Zogby initiative, and it's especially true for Melkites, for Syrians and Antiochians, the Middle Eastern kind of this Middle Eastern communion, and I've encountered this certainly in Canada, uh, where um, they feel such a strong desire to be together that they're willing to kind of override other things which are much more important or higher than just your desire, right? Desire, it's kind of like you know, falling in love with a woman, you can fall in love with her, certainly, but that does not mean marriage and all that stuff automatically because first you have to check your feelings whether they're correct or not correct or whatever mm -hmm. right um so i think that initiative is misguided but for a kind of uh very noble uh in certain ways uh, th reasons but they sh you know they went overboard with it right so Again, as I said, I won't go into much uh, like historical stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, whatever is free and everyone can read, it's still stuff I, I, I read. So it's not like I'm an expert. So I'll just be, you know, rehashing whatever you can find yourself. But I think it's important to kind of look at two points that which Zogby made, um, uh, you know, Archbishop Zogby made in 1995 in February, which is the, the two point profession of faith, the famous thing, right? So. Mm -hmm. The first point was, I believe everything which Eastern Orthodoxy teaches. Now, right away, this is problematic, right? Of course, probably what he wanted to say is, and that's another problem, intentions versus how it is objectively. I think I spoke about that, um, about councils in general, that people, I think, are overdue with the, what was the intention of the author. Like, well, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, the the transcendental Thomist. What's his name? Uh, the bad guy. I forget his name. Anyway, a modernist uh, kind of theologian during the Second Vatican Council. He was kind of considered one of the ghostwriters for the um, uh, for for one of the uh, letters. It's a guy who has a brother, and the the second brother is a great guy. Uh, name is Hugo, I think. Okay, there we go. Slava right. Bohu. Okay, um, I think I think that's uh, you said you said Thomist. Um, Transcendental Thomist. Transcend Eve, I, I know Eve Congar. Are you talk, talking about or did, no? Did, keep going. There, uh, there's so little of them that you can right. Kind of go uh, Congar. Um, what what it's what it sounds like what you're describing is um, what's his name? De Chardin. Uh, te no. Tellard. Uh, uh, Tellard. Tellard. Uh, uh, he had a brother. He's mm. also a writer. Hugo, uh, not Chavez, obviously. I'm trying to <laughs> oh, type in it. Um, not Congo. Hugo. Anyway, it doesn't matter really. Yeah. But anyway, th let's say, well, those guys were, th uh, some of them were there during Second Vatican Council, so it doesn't really matter who. But the point is, they had some intention, which was wrong, because they're heretics, or what, whatever you want to call them. Mm. Um, hence, the document of the Vatican II is illegitimate because those guys were clearly non-Catholics. But 
uh, as I said in, in that uh, kind of small video, that Holy Spirit, is, that's not how Holy Spirit works. It can work through any, uh, and I'm not comparing it to them, but uh, in the Gospels, he uses dirt and spit to perform miracles. So right. he can perform miracles and do correct things through anyone, uh, through anyone he wants. Um, so anyway, um, um, so yeah, what, I'm, what I was saying is what he meant probably uh, that is uh, Archbishop Zogby or Elijah Elias. Um, what he was trying to say that orthodoxy has everything that Catholics have, but then Catholics need have an additional kind of set of things. Mm -hmm. However, we'll get to the second point, which is clear where that won't be possible, right. where that additional stuff is not possible. But anyway, um, here one needs to really look at like, um, that I believe everything orthodoxy uh, believes, right? If he said reversed, uh, orthodoxy teaches everything that Eastern Catholic teaches, I'm sure orthodox would tell him that's not the case. But I think it's a, a, a lot of times where the hierarchs talk with other hierarchs, they talk with a more enlightened, sorry to use that term, but more enlightened people who are more progressive in a, in a lot of cases so they feel that what they hear from other bishops or from other priests is what orthodoxy is which is oftentimes is not the case because just like us we have they have not in the same way but they have some sort of magisterium which when their bishop or a metropolitan or someone does not follow then that means that doesn't represent orthodoxy mm -hmm. but anywho um the, this kind of goes for positive stuff, like orthodoxy believes in two natures of Christ or in the Trinity or in other things which we hold as well. So these positive things for positive teachings, that's true. So uh, because orthodoxy is generally conservative, it didn't exclude any of the things, although that's also kind of uh, questionable. But if you include negative things, meaning things that the Orthodox reject. Here, if you want to stay a faithful Catholic, meaning follow the definitions of papal infallibility and of other dogmas, if you accept uh, Florentine Council as a f ecumenical council, which actually a lot of Zogbeites don't. I don't know about personally uh, Archbishop Elijah, I don't know enough about it, but certainly a lot of people who support his vision uh, oftentimes see, uh, actually I've seen it in one book, but I didn't see like a, a specific source. So I, I'm not going to quote it, quote it per, verbatim. But the point was that after the Zogby initiative, a lot of Catholics were inspired by this vision. And so they would say if Zogby initiative would go through Florentine council, uh, I don't know, you name it, any council after the seventh council, would, have, would be viewed as a pious opinion of uh, this Suiuri church, which is the Roman church, right? So anything which did not include full delegation of the Orthodox party, which then I don't see how Florentine council is not included in this because Greeks did come, but I guess there weren't enough of them, I don't know. Uh, all the other councils like First Vatican, uh, I don't know about Second Vatican because they love sec Second Vatican, but First Vatican certainly, or Trent, would become just a pious kind of local council, which the whole ecumenical church or the, the, uh, the universal church doesn't have to abide by, right? It's kind of like their opinion, we can hold other opinion, right? Um, but uh, if you wanna hold, if you wanna be Catholic in that way, at least to accept these councils, there is no way uh, you can accept the negative positions that the Orthodox have, namely rejection of the filioque, and I'll speak about this very quickly, but rejection of filioque, rejection of immaculate conception, or right now I would say even not only immaculate conception, but of, uh, of um, ontological sinlessness of Mary. I say ontological because Orthodox do accept she was sinless, but it's the problem why she was sinless, right? Mm -hmm. So this, or, um, you know, um, so certain things, certainly, like when I hear priests say this, um, kind of Zogby-eyed sounding things, oftentimes they don't mean the substance of the Zogby 
uh, fate of the Zog B position. So right. like, let's say there's not really a difference between us. And then you say, oh, how so? It'll say, well, Filioque, and then they start kind of doing a Fili uh, Eastern take on Filioque, which goes back to the fathers. Or they will do uh, also about sinlessness of Mary. They will also, and which is all true, right? But uh, you actually, that's the point, right? That you have to Catholicize it. You have to kind of be Catholic to see it uh, that way. Well, that's the problem. You have low battery. That's why it's going off from time to time. Or um, uh, what's that term called? The place between heaven and hell in English? I keep Purg forgetting. Purgatory. Purgatory, right. Sorry. My, uh, some terms... I know I don't know them in Russian. Some terms I don't know them in English for some reason. <laughs> or some of them I know, but I keep forgetting. Anyway. It's the so, unique problem, right? Are you Russian? Yeah. Are you English? Choose a side. Right. Pick a lane. As Russians say, if you are Russian, that means you're Orthodox. So it's a common joke we, also, we always say with our, my Catholic friends. Um, anyway, so, um, or like rejecting that. So for some, re as for some issues, sure, it's very easy to kind of say like, well, it's not really a problem. For example, purgatory very quickly fixed by uh, going to um, aerial toll houses in orthodoxy. If you right. understand it in a very like small old orthodox manner, mm -hmm. uh, it can be accepted as a version of purgatory. Because right. with purgatory, you don't have to accept kind of the, the imagery that comes from purgatory right? Like fire and all that stuff, which is usually what the Orthodox, the Orthodox have problems with, like fire, because it sounds like originism, cleansing fire, that type of stuff, right? But the reality that there is a state between uh, heaven and hell, kind of, that it's, you are going to heaven, but there is some period of time where you are experiencing suffering that cleanses you, that allows you to kind of clean your venial sins or, um, you know, the, the sins that can be cleansed and for yes. a, to, to go into beatific vision, right? So right. Um, aerial toll houses is very much like that, just the imagery is different. They're not using fire, they're using, you know, the... And it's present in a lot of Byzantine prayers. We pray to Theotokos, especially for us not to have this at the compline, for example, at the end, we pray that she may uh, protect us from the demons that will torture the soul. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're praying to her, because if we're going to hell, it's not, that's not what we're saying, right? Because then there's no point, right? There are other prayers okay. which explicitly say, right, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, give us the grace not to be damned or whatever, but it's not very much present in Orthodox uh, prayers. But uh, this particular thing is where you're praying to Theotokos so that demons don't torture you, um, right, for too long, that she kind of eliminates this torture and you can go to directly to, uh, to her son, right, to, to Jesus, right? So these things can easily be fixed. But again, you need to have a preconceived Catholic kind of way of looking at it already to be like that, right? In order for you to be able to uh, kind of uh, back engineer this or whatever you, you call this in English, right? Um, uh, but if we accept orthodoxy as is their positions, that involves and includes these rejections. Mm -hmm. So we cannot in all honesty, in good conscience, staying Catholics say, well, you can kind of reject these because you can't reject these, right? So for example, uh, Florentine Council, I have this little in Russian book uh, called Florentine Council. It has um, a few documents, um, like it has uh, Latentur uh, uh, Celli, which is the, uh, the bull uh, for the union with the Greeks. Uh, and actually in first paragraph, it's giving a very progressive way of looking, looking at it. And like some people will say like, you know, Florentine council is very Romanish or, you know, whatever. Uh, and in some ways, of course it is, you can't like uh, deny that, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's another issue uh, we can talk about, but sure. um, the council, the, or Pope Eugene, I think specifically, yeah. uh, I think it was Pope Eugene. Yeah. Pope Eugene, the fourth mm -hmm. um, speaks about the fact that how differently Greeks describe filioque, but basically what they're saying is filioque, because what is filioque about? It's the role of the son in the procession of the Holy Spirit. And Pope Eugene specifically mentions that for a lot of Easterners, filioque was problematic because they saw it as uh, talking about two sources, 
and two processions, two separate processions, which goes against, obviously, against the uh, not only treatology of the, the Cappadocians, but also Latin uh, treatology. But due to the language difference, that's how it sounded to them, right? And then, again, Pope Eugene very progressively speaks about the fact that one reality is expressed through different two different kind of languages two different issues or two different uh, ways of thinking about it mm -hmm. so which kind of sets the tone for how these things are supposed to be done you're supposed to find in catholicism in the catholic church fullness of truth which then you realize because catholic church for a you know a large period of its history was latin uh in, the, in its majority, right? So it was uh, most Catholics were Latin Rite Catholics, right? right. Um, or versions of Latin Rite, let's say. Um, but um, then when Easterners come in, they bring a different language with them. So from the perspective of Latins, because some aren't tolerant, Latins have to be tolerant of a different way of speaking that Easterners will bring with them. And Easterners should not be ashamed to kind of just adopt very Latin uh, ways of speaking about it. They shouldn't be ashamed either of like, you know, quoting St. Thomas like some are. But what I'm saying is they shouldn't be kind of always like, well, it has to be father and the son. It can't be through the son because this is how Catholic Church speaks about it. I think that's wrong because, uh, again, I think... Uh, this is a valid way through the sun is a valid way of speaking about this reality. On the other hand, Easterners cannot be like, accept one uh, interpretation of through the sun, which is a very late and B goes against um, uh, church tradition from our perspective. At least there's a very good article by uh, an Orthodox person actually. Um, he has a blog, I think it's for the unity of the churches um, in Latin. Um, he hasn't posted anything there, but anyway, he has um, this article about uh, Blessed Confessor Beckus, uh, John Beckus, uh, patriarch, right? Who, and the article is called Beckus as a critic of um, the Orthodox as readers of the fathers. Mm. Or I think it might be not uh, Orthodox, it might be of um, Palamas specifically, or Mark of uh, Eugenicus. I haven't read it in a while. So, mm -hmm. But the point is, it's a very good um, way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Critic of reading of the fathers. Right. Because they're all reading the same fathers. Beckus quotes, like his whole, um, uh, his, all of his works are quoting fathers. And the, the kind of, the, the argument is over how to read them. Because let's say he reads Cyril of Alexandria, who speaks about that there is no dis distinction between essence and energy. Explicitly, he says so, mm -hmm. right? So when we read it, or let's say not even we, when a Scotus reads that, that's one thing. When a Thomist reads that, that's another thing. When a Polemite reads that, that's a third thing, right? But what Beckus is saying is that certain readings are not acceptable. And so he says, um, talking about uh, Gregory of Cyprus, I think specifically, um, that, uh, and don't quote me now, but I think it's about Gregory of Cyprus, um, uh, where he criticized him for misreading the fathers and reading into them novel teachings. Right. So that novel teaching is, of course, the, the so-called economic uh, procession of the, the spirit through the sun. So what, what that means is uh, he's not uh, sending the spirit ontologically that it's not, he's not actually literally involved in the procession. He simply, um, this is simply how it manifests in our kind of reality. When a person, a living human being sees it, when the son says, I send you the spirit, mm -hmm. it's economical uh, procession that Christ is not really involved. It's the father, but we perceive it as the Christ giving it to us. So point of Beckus was that's unacceptable that mm -hmm. you can't, uh, if you want a uh, union, we can't start it off by rejecting the previous reading of the fathers uh, and then the entering this new novel reading of the fathers, right? So anyway, uh, if you uh, qu question on like, cause I'll move to the second point, but if, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, uh, if you want me to. No, that, that's uh, interesting. The, the, the last point that you, that you made, um, Vitaly was interesting. Cause it sounded like 
you know, that, that whole distinction is like, well, we perceive it as coming through the, through the son, but it's actually directly from the father. It almost sounds like some sort of like, you know, Islamic, like fiqh decision, like jurisprudential kind of like, you know, what is like, is it, I don't know. It, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound Catholic. Right. You know, to be and, and, and actually it sounds heretical, but because that's exactly what early um, forms of anti-Trinitarianism would say. They say Trinity is one, but we just perceive it uh, kind of through different kind of modes of its existence. Right. So yes. we perceive the father, we perceive the son or the Holy Spirit, but it really it's the same. It's one thing, which it kind of is. But their point was that there is no distinction at all between persons, right? right. It's just Winters. one, which is Muslim kind of Tawhid, uh, yeah. Tawhidi kind of um, monotheism with kind of like this kind of thing. Oh, well, God, you know, kind of uh, works in mysterious ways and we perceive him indifferently, right? So right. It, that's kind of how it sounds. And actually, Beckles in this Byzantine tradition called his opponents with various ancient names of ancient heresies. Because that's what Byzantines do. Byzantines <laughs> love to use names of ancient heresies to say, like, kind of like I think modern Catholics love this word Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. I hear it all the time. And they say, like, well, this is kind of a form of Gnosticism. And if, well, I, I'm not very, I'm not a scholar, but I, my education is in religious studies. And I know that has nothing to do with historical Gnosticism. Right. So it just became this word that has this very little connection with reality. Right. It's evolved, yeah. The the modern, the mod, definitely the modern um, interpretation of like different different heretic heterodox Catholic positions as being Gnostic is, yeah. Right. It's 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 divorced from the historical Gnostic heresies. Absolutely. I mean, it has some connection, obviously. Like we all know, like about secret knowledge. That part is right. true, but that's it's so much more than that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, please, please, Vitaly, go 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 to the second point that the declaration. Uh, right. Fun. So, um, uh, and I, I kind of, I think it's very much for, uh, relates to the first point, right? Because he says, I'm in communion with the Bishop of Rome as the first among the bishops, so far so good, according to the limits recognized by the Holy Fathers of the East during the first millennium before the separation. Now that is a whole different can of worms, which is very, very problematic. Yeah. So I find this issue with the Orthodox, and I actually talked with, a, with a, um, a guy recently who actually said that. He said, well, at least the Orthodox are following the procedures and like the spirit of how things were uh, as it was during the first millennium. And then I said, like, in what way? And he said, well, they never appealed to Rome. And then the first thing I asked him, have you read the Acts of the Councils? Because you can kind of, the, the standard Latin ones are, you know, go back to the Clement of Rome, like start from a very far or from St. Ignatius. And these things I recognize as being problematic, meaning, of course, I read them the way Catholic apologists say they should be read. But I mean, I recognize that it's problematic because if you have a different kind of viewpoint vision, you'll read it differently. But what you have, to, what you have with Acts of the Councils is right away uh, the issue of how to read what you see. So if Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox claim that they're doing exactly what was done in the first millennium, they have a few stumbling blocks there. Uh, namely, the fact that Pope of Rome and his legates uh, are always constantly uh, mentioned, not simply as uh, according to the limits Right. So, I mean, there are limits, of course, even to current papal power the way we see it. Right. Um, which is not often talked about, but there are, of course, some limits. Right. Uh, or even to the way we interpret um, infallibility, there are limits to it. Right. Right. Um, so but the point is, is that, for example, I, I think I mentioned it, a few quotes. I'll, I'll try to do a video on like, I'll just go through the acts uh, in entirety and just comment on certain points. But uh, there are a lot of places where the interpretation of St. Matthew, where Christ is speaking to Peter, not anyone else. He's not talking about faith of Peter. He's not talking about other apostles. He's speaking directly to Peter. Uh, 
in his role, right? And this is kind of the backing point of why, uh, of the role of Peter, right? The keys. Um, and they mentioned several times he was received the keys and he still has the keys in his successor. That's why we have to refer back to the successor of Peter. Now, obviously the Orthodox can read it and see it because when I did uh, my initial kind of thing was I did um, excerpts from those papists kind of quotes from the acts mm -hmm. in Russian. I published it. And then the first commenter in was in of Kontakti, which is the Russian Facebook. Yeah. Uh, he said, is this your translation? I'm like, no, it's a classical translation by Kiev Pichera Sklava, which is, you know, Orthodox monastery. He says, because, because if it's not your translation, if it's a regular Orthodox translation, this is just, uh, he used this, uh, millennia, uh, millennial uh, slang called uh, uh, for lovers of Russian language called uh, zashkvar, which is very. It sounds very nice. Um, I'm not even sure how to what that exactly means in in Russian, mm -hmm. but basically it's like just something that makes it completely like dirty and filthy. Which which me, me he what he meant what he tried to say was that if this is actually translation, which is actually what the council said that the the orthodox position just seems ridiculous <laughs> and he was an orthodox guy yeah. he was an orthodox christian mm -hmm. but of course in my head i right away know the loving being the devil's advocate uh hating the devil but loving to be his advocate for some reason um i always i right away in my head i know what the orthodox will say and the number one go-to reply to that is this is byzantine politeness that this is how the ancient talked. They would talk up a person in order to kind of elevate his status to show that he's so great and that's why kind of his moral character, that's how we praise him. But whenever one reads the acts in the context, that's not what's, what's happening. So it's clearly that the legates are speaking about specific interpretation and specific role of the Bishop of Rome. Mm -hmm. Second way to go around it that the Orthodox usually do is they'll say, well, those are legates. Of course, they're Roman. So, of course, they'll say these things. But the problem is, A, no one rejected this point of view. Because this would be a very easy thing to do for, uh, for heretics to first refer to that. Well, none of us, right, Eastern guys? None of us believe this. This is just Roman stuff. Like, what, what, what are they talking about? Not a single Eastern bishop aside from heretics, ever question, even heretics actually never questioned these things. No one ever brought up. Then secondly, one can say, well, maybe it was brought up, but it was never included in the Acts. And then my second reply is, well, why didn't the Eastern Orthodox Christians or Byzantine Catholics before the schism, whatever you want to call them, never, never uh, well, actually included these sayings of legates into the acts of the councils and never included those supposed replies that were there because it never was brought up. Mm -hmm. But my point is not really to go apologetics and to prove this point, but the point is, is that if you're an Orthodox Christian, you have to explain this. Right away, we have maybe from our perspective, at least equal claims at the very least. I, of course, I don't think they're equal. I think our claim is much, much stronger. But let's say equal claims to how to view this. Mm -hmm. So right away, when he says, when our uh, Metropolitan Elijah says, or Elias, if you're a Melkite, um, when he says, recognized by the Holy Fathers of East during the first millennium, you still run into the problem of how we interpret it. Mm -hmm. Now, the way to go with this, and I think that's kind of how Zogby, Archbishop Zogby, wanted to go through this, is that we leave it without interpretation. So we just accept this kind of two points, because Orthodox can't accept this, right? They can mm -hmm. say, to the limits recognized by the Holy Fathers of the East during the first millennium. Mm -hmm. Now, Catholics can have meaning behind this, the meaning that they want, right. meaning the limit was very unlimited so to speak mm -hmm. um right so some say like well pope never got involved into other business uh, business of other churches well i always give the example of theodore of blessed theodore who was reestablished as a bishop of cyrus by pope without referring to anyone 
He didn't ask the uh, Patriarch of Antioch, no one. He reestablished him by himself as a legitimate bishop. Of course, then, Archib uh, uh, Patriarch of Antioch, or uh, I don't think he was a patriarch at that time, but anyway, the major bishop of Antioch then would have to, of course, give him jurisdiction, recognize him, all that stuff. But the point is, the ban on Bishop Theodoret, who was suspected of Nestorian heresy, was lifted by the Pope without any other kind of asking anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. So right away, then, the, the problem is, what is the objective of union? Is it the union of faith, or is it just we're all friends again? And I think, as I mentioned it earlier, I think this is especially true for uh, the Middle Eastern Syrian Antiochian um, and to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Maronites. Maronites have a very strong Catholic identity, unlike most others. But for some, from time to time, you hear this from them as well. This desire, just let's, let's be together. We're almost together. Why don't we just like skip all these details? The problem is, A, what is a detail to everyone is different. Right. To me, maybe that's a detail. To you, maybe that's a big issue, right? So who decides, again, what's a smaller issue or not? Um, and um, it actually goes against ecclesiology, so both Catholic, Catholics and Orthodox. So Metro, uh, Archbishop Zogby might be able to accept this. Uh, maybe a few number of Antiochian bishops will accept this. Majority won't, though. Because they've been educated in proper ecclesiology, ecclesiological theories related to um, to their schools. So then another, the, the only other option then is essentially for Catholics to become Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. Because if we say, um, we'll, we won't consider these dogmas, right? And real Orthodox will only accept uh, their interpretation of what First, the, the limits of the Bishop of Rome is essentially we're becoming Eastern Orthodox, right? Exactly. And the only way to go around it, as I said, mentioned in the first kind of uh, few minutes when I started speaking about this, is saying that Trent, that First Vatican are only local councils and opinions. Right. But if you're an Eastern Orthodox and you hear this, you right away know what's the, what the problem with this is as an Eastern Orthodox. Because the local councils, which are accepted by um, the, I wanted to say Uma, which is the, you know, the Muslim church, but uh, the, the whole community, the whole universal church, mm -hmm. these local councils become binding equal to uh, ecumenical councils. That's why if you open the corpus of Eastern Orthodox canon law, uh, which includes the seven councils, it also includes acts of the, uh, not acts, sorry, canons of the apostles. Some include also... Uh, the, uh, I could say, deuterocanonical, but in reality, it's fake. Um, also, and other acts of the, uh, of the apostles, as well as local councils, including Western councils, Latin councils, speak, talk about like uh, being able to accept the, because Orthodox really, they don't have this view that a lot of Byzantine Catholics do, that there is this Latin church, then there's this Eastern church, then the Eastern church is Byzantine, then there's Malankar or Malabar or, that type of stuff. Orthodox don't view it like that. They view that there is church, especially after uh, Patriarch Tikhon, uh, among Russians who started to work on uh, translating the lives of Western saints before the schism. They have a very great appreciation of the West. The, the difference is they see it as Orthodox West. So right. when O believer an old man in some, you know, Ural mountains will say like, well, the, Car the, the, the Council of Carthage in North Africa said this, that's why I can't believe this, right? So he's quoting a local Latin council. So the problem is it's impossible, both according to Catholics and the Orthodox, to not just, oh, it's a local council. Just because it's a local council, it doesn't mean that we don't accept it because it's either small o orthodox or it isn't right we can't have two separate opinions councils never work like that uh all even local byzantine uh eastern orthodox councils were there to eliminate any kind of shadow of a doubt about a certain issue post 
uh, seven council councils are a great example. What, why, why do we need to this? Why do we need to accept this view uh, uh, of Paul Lamas concerning essences and energies? If it, these are minuscule details compared to these things, right? Um, why do we need to accept that? Or uh, and I'm asking as an Eastern Orthodox. Or why do we need to reject um, Calvinistic soteriology, which was rejected by the Council of the uh, of um, the Patriarchs of Eastern Patriarchs? Right. Um, so if those are theological opinions, why can't we just bring in the Protestants, the everyone together? Of course, someone will say, usually a Roman Catholic, like uh, what's his name? Uh, that guy who Ratzinger banned from teaching in um, seminaries, um, uh, Kunk? Hans Kunk. Kunk. Yeah, Kunk, right. Like, well, someone will say like, well, yeah, sure. Why not? But then really we're not... I mean, that's an issue to be discussed. I'm not brushing it off. I'm just saying, like, I ha we have to choose some limits right now for the discussion, right? Of course, we can interact with those type of people as well. But if we're talking about more or less average, faithful, orthodox, and Catholics, this is very problematic. So mm -hmm. that's why I think Zogby initiative by itself is problematic. Now, if we have time... Uh, or maybe for another episode or whatever, there's a whole issue of people right now who hold on to certain version of the Zogby initiative. Of course, they don't have to hold it as like some dogmatic point of view. So all of, a lot of them change it, make it a bit more Catholic, a little less Catholic, even if that's even possible, right? Um, like a great example of, um, you know, Father Robert Taft of Blessed Memory, uh, who I certainly respect as a liturgist and uh, as a scholar. Uh, I do have to say, though, I, ha I find some of his views are unacceptable personally to me as a convert. Mm -hmm. And uh, last thing I wanted to mention, and again, sorry, I, didn't, I guess if I'll forget, but you can ask questions uh, right after if we have time. Um, you have to understand the mentality of an Eastern Orthodox if you're a Byzantine Catholic right now, especially if you are, uh, came from a Roman Catholic background. And I don't mean uh you know like you've been born and raised as a roman catholic and then for whatever reason you kind of wanted to switch rights because it's you know byzantine liturgy is beautiful um you have to realize the mentality the difference between mentality of you as a former roman catholic who wants to defend uh byzantine catholicism uh, against latinizations and all that mentality of a person who's been byzantine catholic all his life let's say you're Ukrainian, right? Or Ruthenian or Russian, whatever you want to say, right? And then third, when you're an Orthodox looking into Orthodox, looking into Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak about the two other ones because I'm not, uh, you know, that. Although I can kind of, uh, kind of understand the Roman Catholic perspective because I did practice Latin rite for, for a few years uh, before I switched back. Um, that for most people this is very much a statical thing so for instance i would not have a problem with uh, let's say corpus christi procession if was if it was done in a kind of acceptable uh, way visually aesthetically right so once i see like a monstrance or whatever it's called right i kind of i feel strange because that that's not kind of my contact uh, my kind of thing right? right so i would feel it's alien right mm -hmm. but let's say if we take uh, pre-sanctified gifts and that moment when the priest exits the, the iconostasis and walks slowly uh, in front of the iconostasis carrying the, the blessed sacrament, right? Already consecrated. And we all drop to our knees or, you know, make a prostration. Then it's, it's a pretty much it's veneration of the sacrament that has already been consecrated, right? Yes. And let's say there is nothing, Ill, I, uh, technically, if I would, you know, for some reason, and again, some Orthodox do this, by the way, uh, or not exactly this, but this type of things, where they would just push kind of this time limit where the priest is walking longer. They would just make it a bit longer so I can pray to in front of the sacrament a bit more thorough or a bit longer or whatever. This would not be very alien to me. I would maybe I'll say like, oh, this is strange. I, I think they should do it quicker or whatever. But it wouldn't be like I wouldn't have this, you know, gut reaction. Oh, this is disgusting Latinization, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, most of these things where they say like the the Eastern uh, Byzantine heritage should be preserved, 
for the most part, it's very aesthetic, right? So when I was converting, to me, it was kind of difficult to at first accept, um, you know, Ukrainian um, Greek Catholic Church, not as a, as a body, because I, I was very glad that there are Eastern Catholics, right? But just a visual aspect, like I would see priests without beards, it was very unusual to me, right? In my head, I, I would, uh, of course, I would say like, well, what is important, Vitaly? Is it beards or faith in Christ and being in union with, with, uh, with, with him, right? Uh, salvation or having beards, right? As much as I love beards, right? It's, I would have to, you know, say Christ, not beards. The, the, there's a, um, a, a priest who baptized our, our youngest child. Um, I, I mentioned to this privately, but he was mm -hmm. uh, Ukrainian, sort of a mixed Ukrainian-Russian background, grew up in Siberia, but his family was sent there. I'm very sorry. I think that, that's my children in the background. Um, playing on a kazoo. Blessed fact. sounds of children. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and he's a he's a he's a Ukrainian Greek Catholic priest in the Redemptorist order, and um, I remember he I at at, so, at some points I shave my beard I grow it out I shave it again and at one point I was growing it back and we were coming out of divine liturgy and this priest approached me and he's like I've got something to tell you he said he says and this comes from our Orthodox friends and I said okay what is it Father and he said it in Ukrainian but I, I'm I'm going to guess it's pr pretty close to Russian and he said bezborodu nemaspasinya. So without without a beard, there is no salvation. <laughs> when you were talking about that, and he had he he has like a very very thinly cut, like not a not a traditional not like yourself kind of right. full beard, but but again, <laughs> I thought, right, right. What what is it? I, I I see, and I laughed. I, I laugh at it, right? Because it's it's like, is is that really something you need for salvation? Right, and, and also people uh, usually focus, like I have to say this, that I, at that time, I was focused only on specific things. Like other things, for some reason, didn't bother me, but for other people, it's a different thing. Like uh, a lot of people who follow the Zogbiite position, like the priests are almost clean shaven or like they have the stubble and they don't think anything of it. Or they baptize children, not by dunking, but by pouring over. Which to me as a former old believer was a very difficult thing to overcome because of this strong tradition of how it's supposed to be done, um, to my mind, of course, right? Um, and other things, but other things I wouldn't care about. Like, and I find some people are like that. Like, for example, no one uh, had a problem with Venice being heavily Byzanti Byzantinized, right? It was heavily, heavily Byzantinized. And I, I would say Western Church from about late middle ages or very late middle ages through Renaissance was heavily, heavily Hellenized, right? Even look at the Renaissance authors like um, Marcello Ficina and those guys, they were studying Greeks and they very highly thought of the Greek thing. Uh, more so, uh, even so that uh, even Greek pagans who in a very minority cases still existed in Greece or Neoplatonists would have a very comfortable time in Italy teaching and, you know, uh, kind of saying very heretical things because they were so stricken by kind of Hellenic um, culture. And um, Father Athanasius uh, McVeigh, if I say this last name correctly, um, mentioned very, I think, uh, made a very, I think, uh, smart remark in this case that uh, cultural influence uh, is very, um, changes from time to time. Like obviously in beginning Byzantine Empire, because it was the the Roman Empire, had the 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 strongest influence on everyone. So everyone was Byzantinized to that extent or the other. Then after 16th, 17th century, the tide turned and the West became predominant kind of power. And so you get a lot of these things, Western things, that to an old believer, let's say, who considers himself like a faithful Russian Orthodox person, these post Nikon churches, vestments, uh, hats, uh, theology even, is very, very alien, right? But no one thinks like, oh, well, then all believers are correct, because they don't have this emotional attachment to them, but they have emotional attachment to, some, to something else, right? Yeah. So that brings me to theological things, right, which is the issue, right? So a lot of people I find really study Eastern Orthodox positions, not the way I studied them, which is mo how most Orthodox study them, reading fathers, 
uh, reading classical Orthodox literature, not Mandorf. I read one Mandorf book in my life. I've never read Schmemann in my entire life. I think I've read maybe two, like two lines from him. Uh, or you name any other author that is very uh, common for, for um, um, American, Canadian, Eastern Orthodox or Catholics, like, you know, Schmemann, Calistus Ware, right, right. Um, the, the whole, you know, for more traditionalists, I guess, Seraphim Rose and yeah. those type of guys. Now, Seraphim Rose actually is read in Russian. And one, my first religious book that was given to me as a child was Life After Death by Seraphim mm -hmm. Rose, mm -hmm. which is my then godmother said, uh, I, then my godmother said, uh, I think I mixed something up. I don't think that's the book I wanted to buy. I think it's a very heavy book, but if you like, you can you can read it. And it was the scariest read of my life. And I read it like five years, maybe after she gave it to me. Um, and I was reading through and like, oh, this is insane. This is scary, right? Like about like what happens with the demons when they take your soul and all that. Like I was really scared. But anyway, the point is, is that, um, or Florovsky, you know, you name it, right? Yeah. Um, these guys are not technically classical Orthodox literature, at least from a Russian Orthodox perspective. I don't know about Greek Orthodox, but I'm pretty sure from Greek Orthodox perspective, that's true as well. Yeah. Well, what I read was, uh, what I would read rather, right, is fathers first and foremost, maybe uh, scholarly commentaries on the fathers, maybe, even the, the that's probably not, uh, not the case, um, right? So I would read fathers and I would read classical stuff. St. Tikhon, uh, well, for Orthodox, St. Tikhon of Zadonsk, of course, I think he's holy, but just so that if some traditionalists view this video, they don't get on my back for saying saint. But um, Tikhon of Zadonsk, um, uh, then um, I, for some reason, when I start speaking English, their names just fly out of my head. Um, but anyway, you get the point, right? Well, Serafim Sarovsky didn't really write it. He didn't write anything. But but anyway, a lot. There are a lot of like Stefan Yvorsky. Um, uh, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of them. Anyway, w when you read them, uh, Florovsky called this Latin captivity, hmm. but they include classical Orthodox position on a whole array of issues. And actually, you can even get the uh, the Orthodox divide between so-called Orthodox Catholics and Orthodox Protestants, getting to the the term Orthodox in union with Rome, right? Um, um, that's what I read. That's how I got my orthodoxy from. Not Schmemann or Mandorf, right? Or Losky or, you know, some other more enlightened authors. And my point is a lot of Byzantine Catholics uh, get, or American uh, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, get their view of orthodoxy from those books rather than classical literature and actually reading the fathers. Right. To no fault of theirs because, well, how many fathers are translated into English? I mean, some are translated. Right. But in Russian, I have full collection of most major fathers, uh, Eastern fathers, at least, right? I have full collection of Chrysostom, Cyril, uh, of Alexandria, and of Jerusalem, from the Syrian, Theodore, the Stoda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I can read them. Mm -hmm. Americans can't. Or they will read excerpts, which yeah. are often kind of, um, you know, when you read excerpts, oftentimes it's like compiled by someone who maybe doesn't necessarily have an agenda, but will compile based on his kind of uh, leanings and views, right? Yes. So my point is, is that um, these are not necessarily Orthodox positions or Eastern or Byzantine positions, because if you think Byzantine world is so great, then you have to believe the fact that if Latin Catholics had so much diversity theologically, right? You had like these scholastic schools, all of that. Of course, Byzantine world was not, uh, is not very school based. Like it doesn't like schools or whatever, yeah. but the whole array of opinions and how to read certain passages is, you know, it's big. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of room for Catholic and Eastern Orthodox interpretation of those writings, yeah. right? The problem is we can't just be reading however we like it because otherwise we're kind of like Protestants yeah. who can read the gospels. So either there is this position that you're what they call on the gospel and only your soteriological or whatever views are correct. 
So let's say, I don't know, like predestination, double predestination, or as, as Calvin said, that's an issue where the church falls or stands, right? Um, or you become kind of like liberal Protestants. And this is exactly what we mentioned about Zogbiates, right? Yeah. Then if it's so confusing and if it's so clear that we can't agree, then maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe Christ wanted it that way. He left us a book. We read it how our, our conscience tells us, and that's kind of good enough. After all, we do accept basic teachings, although that's, of course, then you ask them, where do you get these basic yeah. teachings like Trinity and stuff like that? But the point is, and that, that's also a true problem for uh, Eastern Orthodox. Oriental Orthodox don't have it as much because mm-hmm. they, Oriental Orthodox, a lot of them are of the position that these are all details. If you believe in two natures, more or less, it's fine. You don't have to accept Chalcedon or you don't have to go with Severus, or you don't have to go with Nestorius. You can just, whatever you like. If there are two natures, and there is some acceptance of unity between those two natures, that's, that's good enough, right? And maybe that's true, mm. if you want it to, to think like that. But definitely that's not an Eastern Orthodox. It's not a Byzantine position. No. Definitely not, right? Mm-hmm. So... Yes, yeah, so right, I, so, I think, Vitaly, you mentioned that, um, that that was kind of connected with that whole idea of the Orthodox in union with, with Rome, right? right? And I kind of, in my mind, put this ad, like, uniot, uniotism is over here, maybe Zogbiite is somewhere in the middle, and Orthodox in communion with Rome is over here. Like, sort right. of like, or may, maybe it's uniots, Orthodox in communion with Rome, Zogbiite, kind, kind of thing. Like, what... Uh-huh. Because again, I, and I mean, like you're you're absolutely right in just in terms of like people who are Orthodox coming to Catholicism, Latin or Eastern are going to view these things one way. Like and like you said of um, uh, Venerable Andrei Sheptitsky, right? A Polonized, Polonized Ukrainian mm-hmm. background, like like myself. I again, I grew up in um, uh, baptized Roman Catholic, but my entire early catechesis was Byzantine because of the school I was attending. And again, right, my where my ancestral villages are, I mean, there's there's a mix. There's some Romanian, mm-hmm. uh, Romanian Orthodox and other things, Polish, like strictly Polish Catholics, but a lot of my ancestors were Byzantine Catholics that were either brought into Orthodoxy or, or Latin Roman Catholicism. So mm-hmm. as an adult kind of choosing that path myself, um, it felt more like I was spiritually coming home. And so mm-hmm. I can I can kind of appreciate, though, that, right, like the way I view these things, right? Because, again, right, I went to uh, the the ordinary form of the Latin Mass, uh, right. Latin Rite Mass growing up. You know, we had divine liturgies at school, you know, kind of once or twice a year. But, you know, that wasn't the bread and butter that my my early faith was was nurtured on. Mm-hmm. And so I can I can totally see what the, po- the points you're making, especially about like that. We, we there has to be some sort of there has to be some sort of consensus consensus or arbiter that's above our positions right and i think right. that's where that that foundational that foundational place of rome comes in and i was going to put point this out too because i thought it was so interesting there was a he's a orthodox apologist online um convert um he's currently in the bulgarian orthodox jurisdiction but i think he was oca to start out with i forget his his name. He's been on a couple uh, reason and theology episodes, and he seems like a very, very ni- nice fellow. Um, mm-hmm. But one of his articles, and I think he mentioned it in, in an interview he did on reason and theology too, was mm-hmm. is, uh, speci- specifically regarding the Orthodox schism surrounding the creation of the of the uh, an- anacephalous church in Ukraine, mm-hmm. anacephalous church in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, he said that the only, he said that the bodies that are currently in schism and fighting, he said that if Rome was still Orthodox, Rome would be the arbiter. Like the, the, he said the, the Patriarch of mm-hmm. Moscow can't be the arbiter in this issue. And the, and the Patriarch of Constantinople cannot be the arbiter in this issue. He said, right. if Rome was still Orthodox, Rome would be the arbiter. And I said, right. that, that's, for me, I'm, I'm like, what a strange position to hold. Like, but obviously there must be more Orthodox than himself that hold that position, right? He, obviously he's not just coming up with his own, own position. There's got to be some sort of Orthodox tradition that says that. Right, right. And, and again, that's, that's, and that's the thing, right? 
So tradition needs development. You can't just, because you're either going to be, again, Orthodox Protestants, and I've heard, and these guys came to my house once to debate me, coming as uh, Orthodox traditionalists, leaving, saying the most Protestant, liberal Protestant things ever, <laughs> right? Because they couldn't go around it, because I would, because I'm not uh, Catholic, I wasn't raised Catholic. So even when I was practicing Latin rites, my whole head was Holy Fathers, you know, saints and all that stuff. So I know this stuff, so I can quote it, prayers and all that stuff. I can't really, at that time, I didn't really read. I mean, I kind of read, but uh, Aquinas and stuff like that, but I wouldn't quote them usually, right? So um, that's the thing. You either develop to, in spiritual life, that's a maximum, I think, that is true for both East and West. You can't stay in the same place. You're either growing or you're falling down. So your doctrine is either developing or it's stagnating and regressing. So in one of my blog spots articles on uh, this whole issue of immaculate conception, especially among all believers, I think I, I showed it that you are either going with one development or you're going with a different development. And a lot of pr the problem comes with people see it not as development, but staying the same. But it's not staying the same because you really, you, you go verbatim with what fathers say, there is no such thing what you're saying, right? Like Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology is a position. It's a, from a theological point of view, of, of course, it's a legitimate position to hold, but it's not a default position. You have to prove it. You have to realize that it's a development of doctrine, of doctrine from an Eastern Orthodox perspective. And then what we have is a development of doctrine from a Roman Catholic or Catholic generally perspective. Right. So, um, yeah, it, either you're developing or not. Right. So uh, when people say Orthodox in communion with Rome, it could mean a whole area of things. Like, for example, our priest always says we are Orthodox in faith, but what he means is Orthodox, small o Orthodox. And he says fathers, he, his point is to make what terms fathers used. They always said Orthodox faith, Catholic church. Right, because when I pray in Russian, uh, Church Slavonic, Svetaya Kafaliciska Vera, right? So Kafaliciska Tserkov, like uh, Catholic Church, right? The, the one thing they do is they do um, not a Latin based kat Kaliciska because it's yeah. the right? Yeah. They do Greek Catholic, so they do f yeah. in Russian. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of Russians uh, say Yakafolik. I'm a Catholic, like F, like yeah. Greek sounding, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, because what they mean is, and actually Russian church oftentimes was called Svitaya Greco Rasiske, Greek Russian, Kafaliciska Tserkev, Vostoka. Right. So, Greek Russian Catholic Church of the East, or Eastern Church, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, even some apologists, um, anti-union apologists, would use the word Eastern to defend that e it's not just a thing, that w because they're Western, or Eastern, Eastern meaning true, because Christ comes from the East and that type of stuff, because right. we pray to the East. And same thing with Catholics. So they recognize that you have to see Catholic Church, but Orthodox faith. Right. So, and that, that's interesting, Vitaly, because I know that at least in the some of the... Um, uh, like uniet lit liturgicons, like uh, Slujebniks that we have, uh, what, what they would call in the in the West, like a missal, that the word, like in the symbol Vera, in the, in the um, Nicene Creed, yeah. Creed mm -hmm. they would use the word Sobor rather than Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, and so, and, and again, right, I, I always found, I always thought that that was strange because like, like it, it's a, it's a Greek word there. I don't know. You just mentioned that there's a Slavonic term of it, but at some right. point the, the terminology got changed from the word Catholic to, to be the Sabor, right? Which means you, what the, you, you, like, it's sort of like right, a, right. a union kind of, uh, it's, it's got similar connotations, but it's not the same right. word. Right. And modern Russian, of course, they Orthodox say Saborne, right? So, yeah. uh, because of the, but before that, at a certain point in Russia, everyone said, right. which is Catholic church, Orthodox faith. Yeah. So if you're using it in that way, fine. But we, the problem is that each term has a connotation. We can't just, you know, say things like, for example, I can say, I don't know, 
uh, I love gay people. It can mean so many things. Or, I don't know, uh, I'm into uh, fighting, right? You'll say, what do you mean you're into fighting, right? And I'll yeah. give you my explanation. Right. But certain phrases have this connotation. Like if you're saying, if in Russia, all of a sudden you're Orthodox and you say like, I am a Catholic with a fuh. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, what are you? Catholic or Catholic even, like right. if you want to go, right? They, they won't, even if you don't mean what you're saying, the word will have this kind of meaning, right? Exactly. So the problem is uh, when people say Orthodox in communion with Rome, what they mean is essentially the Zogbyite position of, I am holding on to the whole Eastern Orthodox theology, and I should say contemporary Eastern Orthodox theology generally, because it's not like they saying, oh, I'm, I don't know, like I'm from the school of St. Ephraim the Syrian, I'm holding on to that school, uh, right? That's not what they're saying. They're saying contemporary Eastern Orthodox theology with all of its positions, mm -hmm. uh, or some of its positions at least, with an addition of, and then that's the problem, right? So some say I'm Orthodox in communion with Rome, and what they mean is, I am all the Eastern Orthodox position plus uh, infallibility plus, uh, you know, the Marian primacy Orthodox, of Rome yeah. or, and all that stuff. Some will say that. Some will do exactly like the second point of uh, that uh, Zogby, uh, Zogby's second point, right? That I am holding on to Eastern Orthodox positions, but I am just staying in communion with Rome because obviously Rome was an arbiter. And since schism, and this is also very problematic, since the schism didn't really happen, there was no real schism. Both are kind of uh, doing, either they're both church teaching or they're both uh, uh, kind of um, good opinions. Right. So I'm of this particular opinion, but I agree that we should stay together. So that's why I'm in communion with Rome, right? As opposed to other peoples who don't realize that they can just, you know, and uh, enter into communion with Rome with, uh, and keeping whatever they think about uh, theology, right? Rejecting filioque, all that stuff, but just being communion with Rome because then uh, you have this great political arbiter who if you have troubles, uh, you know, you can kind of always call uh, the Papa and say like, oh, dear Pope Francis, can you please uh, tell, I don't know, Patriarch Bartholomew not to do this in Ukraine? And he'd say, yeah, sure. You know, kind of like that, right? <laughs> If only uh, it was that easy. If, if and only it was I think, just a phone call. I think this goes to an older Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology that most contemporary Eastern Orthodox reject, but it's very historical. And anyone who studied uh, Orthodox ecclesiology knows about this. That what this sounds like, you know, just having an arbiter is very political, right? So you have troubles, you have this guy, Right, he says you, but it, it's it, there's no real religious uh, point to it, right? There's no like, uh, it's not religious in nature. It's kind of religious, but I'm meaning it's kind of like re politically religious, right? Um, early, uh, a lot of uh, Orthodox ecclesiologists would say that the ec ecumenical councils were called by an emperor, and the emperor is the head of the ecumenical council. He is the guy who makes ecumenical council and ecumenical council uh, gives its validation as opposed to Bishop of Rome. Um, and without the emperor, and that's one of the traditional explanations that used to be made for why Eastern Orthodox currently do not have ecumenical councils is because they don't have a monarch. They don't have an emperor because he is the guy kind of gathering together the oikumena, or that's ecumenical council, right? The ecumen, ecumena, the world together. And he brings them together as this rule. So this is obviously called uh, Caesaropapism. Yeah. Uh, and later was kind of, I wouldn't even say rejected. It was kind of just went away. Kind of much like uh, Mary's pre-purification in years, I would say late 19th century, early 20th century, and very much so after the, the pronouncement of the Immaculate Conception dogma, went away. People don't talk about it. That's actually when the, the Orthodox traditionalists came to my apartment and tried to debate me. They left as these liberals, and one of the issues was Immaculate Conception. Because I said, well, guys, if you read any, any father of the church, 
give me any book. Like I, I have at my home here a few I can show you. Eastern fathers say Mary did not sin because she was pre-purified pre from, uh, uh, from the original stain. And I can show you prayer books where it's all over the place, yeah. right? So if you don't believe this right now, uh, w why don't you, right? Because they do realize that not a single, or I shouldn't say not a single, but vast majority of Russian Orthodox do not believe in Mary's pre purification at all. Right. She's sinless because she just didn't sin. She is like that type of a saint. She's the highest rank of the saint because she right. could have sinned, but she didn't sin. But she had all the same stuff, um, right? Uh, all the same temptations. And hence, when they read like Chrysostom, who said Mary sinned, they'll say, oh, like, well, see, there you go. Chrysostom said, which is another problem of consensus patrum, but that's another issue, right? Um, and that's why I think uh, calling yourself Orthodox um, in communion with Rome is problematic because it's unclear. And back in the day, unlike right now, um, these kind of labels, names, and all that stuff had very high, very a lot of significance. The way you dressed, the way you looked, hence why I kind of understand that the where the beardless Ukrainian priest came from, because that needed to be done. They the mentality for both they actually had the same mentality, both Eastern Orthodox and Catholics, they wanted to differentiate between each other, yes. right? Hence why, well, if they won't shave, because obviously they won't shave, well, because we don't think it's a statement of faith, we'll shave, right? Yeah. And plus, we will look like uh, our Latin brothers who kind of look at us funny because we're all like bearded and stuff. Um, yeah. We will have that rather, right, to differentiate uh, between us, right? So, yeah. and the last point I'll, I'll say is that when I was Orthodox and I would hear these Catholics say stuff like Orthodox in communion with Rome, to me, that was much more heretical than what the, let's say, quote unquote, SSPX, uh, right, uh, kind of Lefebvreist type of uh, guys would say. Because right. to me, the, the, these um, SSPX guys would, were, were closer to my ecclesiology, Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology, than these guys. And actually, I've heard this multiple times from Eastern Orthodox. You guys are such modernists. I will never consider becoming Catholic, even if I believe in papism and all that stuff. But you guys are so modernist. You're so eager to please other people. You'll call yourself any other name. You'll pray with anyone. Put a Hindu in front of you. You'll pray with a Hindu as well to one God. And you'll write a whole document and a deep, deep theological work explaining why this is okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And actually, that was a big problem for me. Because I was willing to accept all these uh, kind of high theological things. But to me, the reality of Catholic Church was very different after Vatican II, right? Mm -hmm. Even I said, I, I, I think I said once, if Catholicism right now was pre-Vatican II, I might have been uh, seduced by the Catholics easier. But because this heretical Vatican II happened, I have an easier way of just saying, well, clearly this is false, right? Right, as an Orthodox, yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's why when people say like, well, I'm Orthodox in faith, but I'm communion with Rome, an Orthodox person says, well, you're a heretic then, because this is impossible, because you either have one faith in one church, or you have uh, many churches and many faiths. And as an Orthodox person, I know there can't be many churches. Mm -hmm. A church cannot be divided. Body of Christ, technically, although some fathers use this imagery of you're tearing the body of Christ, you're making a wound but it's kind of, it's a wound, but it's not torn apart. Well, that's only one type of image because another type of image where fathers say a body of Christ cannot be torn because it's, because if it's torn, he's dead. But since he is eternal resurrected body that cannot be torn, cannot be go through any harm. There cannot be this division. Either there is this church or that church or they're both churches, right? Cause that's another way of, but most even Orthodox, more or less modernist reject this, right? There is this mega church. All of us are part of it. But then obviously they realize this is false because the, the unity of the church, according to Orthodox ecclesiology, is not the bishops. It's the faith, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is no unity in faith, then there is no unity because they don't believe, at least most, aside from maybe, I don't know, Patriarch Bartholomew and his supporters, they don't believe that there is a bishop holding on the whole church together, right? right. That's papist heresy, right? So... 
Well, thanks for, thanks for going through, um, uh, your thoughts on that, Vitaly. I think you're just such a wealth of knowledge and, you know, your experiences behind the, behind the iron curtain, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, coming, coming to the, coming to faith in, in the church established by Jesus Christ is such a, is such a, a powerful witness and a necessary witness for us today. Um, and I just want to say, so I like to me, every time after these, I feel like I talk way, way, way too much, no. but, uh, people have to realize why they have to pray for me because whenever an American, and I've had few Americans tell me that they've, had and i don't want to downgrade their experience of course each individual experience is is that like to them their tragedy is their tragedy so i'm not minimizing it but in perspective when an american tells me he um kind of um he uh, sacrificed so much to be catholic in america where there are countless churches and i hear it like it's kind of uh, to me it's it's just it's it's a bit ridiculous because i have literally maybe like four or five people who I can talk to about these issues. And the problem is I agree with them. So we're kind of like, Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yes, that's correct. And we're all kind of agreeing. And uh, there are such a little number of Eastern Orthodox who I can discuss this and have a fruitful conversation that it's all kind of boiling inside of me. So then when an American asks me these issues, which are very kind of close to my heart, I kind of go off. So, yeah, no, absolutely. So if for, for someone who if thinks I talk too much, I'm sorry, but you have to understand why this is kind of the case. No, absolutely. That makes, that makes, that makes total sense, right? It, you, I'm not, again, not to downplay the role of secularism, especially in the West here, you know, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, like maybe you lose a few Facebook friends and there are the cases where, you know, you're, there's, a lot of issues division in your family over, you know, becoming Orthodox or becoming Catholic, if you're a Protestant or something like that, you know, but it's, it's not the same kind of experience that, that you have, or a lot of people in Eastern Europe or former Soviet states have with the anti-Catholicism and, and uh, yeah. Let's, let's say the Cossacks won't come and burn on your church. Let's yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think I think we lost you there for a second, Vitali. Are you still there? Let's put it like that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anything below. Oh, I'm so sorry we lost you there, Vitaly. If you can hear me. No, oh, there we go. All right. Hi there, we're back. Okay. So sorry, yeah, we lost you there. Yeah, it's fine. Um, no, no, absolutely. Right, the Cossacks aren't going to come and burn burn down your church in in America, but the KGB might come and take you somewhere in in you know a former Soviet state. Um. <laughs> Not that the KGB yeah, I, still I, officially exists. I mean, I, I will, I will disperse some. Uh, I don't know, American maybe miss like it's pretty safe in Russia for most, for the most part. If you're not talking too much or overtly, if it cannot be interpreted as like a danger to the state, then you're fine. However, we do have troubles every step of the way. Uh, it's not like a trouble where, you know, some of us will get arrested and it will have to be martyrs or confessors, but nevertheless, it's kind of, it's unpleasant, you know, it's not yes. that, uh, like even to register our parish, we had to go through, I won't say hell, uh, you know, knowing what horrible things are going on in the world, but from just perspective of like registering, oh, absolutely. you ever went through registration, imagine the worst type of registration you had to do because mm -hmm. of the bank or whatever, this is kind of like our reality. Oh, absolutely. And you know, even, even in Ukraine, right between oh, yeah. right, the Ukrainian Orthodox, right, the Moscow Patriarchate and, and Greek Catholics, right? I've heard right. of stories where uh, the Greek Catholics for generations had a piece of land that was a, um, a summer camp. And then right. the Orthodox conspired one time and they put up a, you know, the giant three bar cross on the land. And right. they went to the civil magistrate and said, look, at, there's, a, there's an Orthodox cross there. This land belongs to us. 
and right. it was legally signed over, right? And the Catholics are like, but we've we have the title, we've owned this we've owned this land forever. And the Orthodox say, well, but there's an Orthodox cross there, so obviously right. you stole it from us, so we want it back. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So I and again, I'm so thankful for um for the the time you spent with us today, Vitali. Um, and I know you're you're very much an advocate for your um your parish in Saint Petersburg. Um, and, and, and the work that you're trying to do, getting, uh, getting a parish building, a, a, a temple, uh, built, um, did you want to just briefly talk about that and how people can, you know, g- you know, reach you and your work on the Russian Catholic or support, uh, your parent, your parish there in St. Petersburg? Uh, well, the, the parish, um, um, I have a link that, uh, Father Alexander, uh, our priest, um, he's, uh, Spanish by nationality and he had um he's um i forget what it's called he's an he's not opus day he's not in opus day prelature but he's in uh i forget what it's called a society of a holy cross i think it's basically was established um at the almost at the same time as opus day prelature but it's not a prelature so he's a regular priest who follows the spirituality of of uh, saint uh I don't know what the English, because I say it in Russian, Jose Maria, yeah, yeah. in English, hopefully, right? Um, um, so he uh, served here um, as a um, Latin rite priest initially in this uh, small suburb of St. Petersburg. Um, um, and um, then he, he was always working for a kind of missionary work among Russians, not among, um, you know, like the, the quote unquote ethnic Catholics. Um, um, so he kind of prayed a lot about it and he's very much rooted in, um, spirituality of Fatima Mm -hmm. and he's not this overt, like, you know, those crazy Fatima guys who only speak about Fatima. He's not like that, but he's very much rooted into, and I think behind you is the icon that he designed, uh, right, right in the middle there. That's the icon he designed, uh, and, uh, Eastern uh, Russian Orthodox, uh, iconographer drew, um, um, his name is, I think it's Ivan and he reposed in the Lord uh, a few years uh, back. So yeah, pray for it, for, for his soul. Um, he, 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 he did a lot of good for Catholics and he drew a lot of icons for Catholics, uh, in St. Petersburg. So, but anyway, and, uh, because he felt this drive to preach to the Russians and he was so inspired by Fatima and the life of blessed Leonid Fyodorov, he decided that there's no other way to do it best than to uh, become kind of one with the people through, you know, learning the right and all that stuff. Yeah. But uh, technically he's still a, a priest um, who, uh, he's basically a Spanish priest still. Mm-hmm. So he submits to bo- two bishops locally here to our Bishop uh, Joseph Worth, mm-hmm. who is Latin, uh, a Latin right bishop, but he serves as um, kind of a leader for uh, Byzantine ordinary. Catholics. Yeah. Right. He's yeah. an ordinary, right? So uh, no matter the tradition, um, technically we have one jurisdiction, but traditions vary. Like we have Ukrainian tradition, Russian tradition. So he kind of covers all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the second bishop is of my priest is the local bishop of Spain. And so uh, when he uh, got uh, registration for our parish and he got the approval of Bishop Worth, uh, Joseph Worth, uh, for construction of the of the the um, the temple, the church, the uh, or, or I should say it's going to be a sanctuary to uh, 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 Our Lady of Fatima. So it's going to be both a church of, of Our Lady of Fatima, like the traditional Russian name, right? How we say Our Lady of Kazan and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also going to be a sanctuary as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, The word we would use in, in English would be like a shrine, like the official shrine. Right, shri- right, shri- right, right. Right. There you go. Right. So because for now, the original of the icon is in that small suburb, Pushkin, um, and it's in a Latin church. So he wants to do another one where it's going to be Byzantine. Right. So he went to Spain to go around Spain. And also, as you probably know, uh, in Portugal, in Fatima, there is a a Russian Catholic um, church, which is now. Yeah, it's right now. um, It's kind of mostly occupied by Ukrainian Catholics uh byzantine right catholics right. who kind of from time to time let's say ukrainize it a little bit which i'm not against but uh you know they put like rushniki and the you know that type of stuff and sometimes uh, russian orthodox serve there but russian catholics are there 
much less than everyone else right. combined. So um, the, the Rushnik, that's, that's not a, I thought that was a more, a more general Byzantine uh, tradition that that's specifically a Ukrainian thing. Well, you, the Rushnik you, you, over let, an icon. Let, let's say Ukrainian Rushnik, like when oh. you see it's Ukrainian, right? Okay. I yeah. mean, Russian, Russians obviously traditionally also put towels. That's very Eastern thing to do, yeah. but uh, they've abandoned that tradition. It's considered like very uh, villagey kind of. So when you see it, usually we know it's <coughs> Ukrainians, right? Oh. Um, but anyway, that's it's, um, just, it's just for fun. I'm mentioning this. I, I love Rushniki <laughs> and Vyshovanka and all that. So yeah. don't come at Right. Um, <laughs> So that's why he went to Spain to his bishop and he went on um, Catholic Spanish TV and um, formed this kind of thing where you donate um, to, um, uh, what's the word you said? Not sanctuary, but shrine. Yeah, the shrine. Right. right. So it's um, donations to the shrine of Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima. So it's a link. I think it goes through PayPal, whatever. Uh, yeah, there's we'll put in Spanish, the description. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And then there's Spanish English uh, version of that. Um, but basically right now we um, also this money that goes there, it's uh, Father Alexander's account. So you can write specifically this is for, I don't know, personally for Father Alexander or for parish or for the construction of the temple. Uh, because right now, so I'll quickly describe, maybe I'll make a video on this one day and maybe I'll, Father Alexander will wave to the people or whatever. You can donate to directly to Father Alexander uh, right. to support so the parish or the, or the, or the building it's, it's of the temple. The same, it's the same account, just write like what you like. So my quick point was that we used to just be uh, in the basement of the uh, of the, um, the cathedral there. Uh, like recently, we've been asked to start paying because uh, we've been there for a while. So now we actually have to cover that stuff. For most of the stuff, of course, we're not like we're not dying from hunger or anything like that. So if you have like children and you want to donate to Africa to that stuff, that's fine, right? But um, uh, but it's kind of we do have to kind of donate and stuff and. Uh, um, you know, we have like, it's kind of, it's a very small like place. You enter, basically you see iconostasis right away. You make like two steps. That's the iconostasis. Then you make two steps there. You're already hit the wall. And then you make one step to the side that there's a wall there. And usually maybe like four, four ish people can stand there. And then there's a, a part kind of goes deep in there where like the singers, um, you know, like we have a few books there, but it's a very small place. And it's kind of difficult to grow, uh, yes. of course, when, again, telling what I said, right, to me, it's fine. But some person comes in, he just been to the most beautiful Orthodox churches, then he comes to the basement. Of course, he should choose Christ and, you know, the unity with the church. But I, we can understand, you know, the kind of that. So hence why we have kind of needs there and also why we need to construct the temple sooner or later, because if you want to grow, if you want to expand, uh, myself and another person who wants to start a monastery as well. So we'll probably be constructing like a, a parish house where the priests and it, us can live. Uh, of course, we won't like have a monastery probably in our lives, but at least there's going to be constructed some little house where two, three, four monks can live uh, and serve there. Um, and then also, of course, Father Alexander also has needs because uh, he has a publishing house um and uh, he really spends all of his money either on the parish on the publishing thing or to travel somewhere so yeah, or to pay for the apartment of course because yeah. again we have to pay for the apartment regular apartment it's not like a special priest apartment latin right catholics usually are paid for by the by their order or by someone we have very fancy apartments there but he lives in a very beat down very beautiful but beat down russian apartment so again if you have Kind of like if you, um, uh, you know, want to support Father Alexander, you can also do so. And if you speak Spanish, all you have to do is type in, uh, I'm not sure what the term for father is in Spanish, but uh, if you type in Alejandro uh, padre. Burgos. Padre. Padre, right. So Padre Alejandro Burgos um, in Spanish and maybe write Fatima and stuff. There is a in long in interview with him, uh, both while he was still Latin, right? Or he was in, in transitional period while he's studying in Rusicum and already when he went recently to Spain to the Spanish TV where he explained in great detail about the parish, the, well, if you know Spanish, that is, of course. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Vitaly. And like I mentioned at the start, um, this has been uh, an episode of The Orthodox Show. I'm the Badger Dad or Lyndon. And um, you can support us here at The Byzantine Life to help keep uh, content like this possible um, on Patreon or by visiting us on our website and um, hitting us up on social media. We always appreciate anything that you can help to give. But obviously, um, Vitaly's cause is far more, um, far more in, 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 need and absolutely like you talk about supporting the church in need i think it's it would be such a great thing to help support vitaly's parish um to build the shrine of fatima in russia what a what a great way to honor our lady and support a very very small but but um faithful uh, catholic catholic community and um so to close us off speaking of our lady uh we're going to pray um what is often called the it is truly right or it is truly meet prayer which is the clo one of the closing hymns to the mother to the theotokos that byzantine catholics pray and we're going to be praying it in church slavonic but in kind of a uh, a mixture of the russian church slavonic and the ukrainian church Sl slavonic and so um uh, our friend vitaly is going to lead us in that but we'll start with um with the sign of the cross Достойно есть, як воистину блажити тя Богородице, присно блаженною при непорочної матері Бога нашого. Честнішою херовим і славнішою без сравнення серафим, без ісління Богослова рожуюш сущу Богородицю тя величаєм. Can I do a small uh, postscriptum, P.S.? Absolutely. So, if you're Ukrainian and watching this, I hope you notice how I said Bohorodicu and stuff. Because <laughs> actually, this is a traditional, it's considered traditionalist pronunci a pronunciation of uh, Church Slavonic which you can enjoy. So though I didn't pronounce all the letters like you do, but uh, her and uh, some other things are uh, kind of, um, was taken from um, uh, the Southern Russia and was accepted by all Russians until Nikon as like the, the go-to pronunciation. Really? So, wow. Yeah. Glory to God. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that, Vitaly. All right. Yeah. I'm ashamed, the ones you do. Bye, bye.